Tonight, as the refugee crisis continues to plague Europe, we speak with Hungarian Foreign Minister Peter Siarto, who attended the first ever U.S. State Department conference on religious freedom. Later, Oscar-winning director of The Exorcist, William Friedkin, joins us to talk about his latest documentary, which captures a real exorcism. And finally, Christians continue to be persecuted in Syria and other parts of the Middle East. How are those religious minorities coping in the region? Maronite Catholic priest Father Andre Mahana will tell us. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. We've got a great show for you tonight. William Friedkin, Peter Ciarto, and Father Andre Mahana are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send us a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Let's get right to it. My first guest represents the first Western government to dedicate an official department to helping persecuted Christians in the Middle East. He's the Hungarian Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he recently attended the first ever Ministerial on Religious Freedom, put on by the U.S. State Department. Now, representatives of governments from all over the world gathered here in Washington in July to advance the cause of religious freedom around the world. Here's my exclusive interview with Hungarian Foreign Minister Peter Siarto. You were part of this religious ministerial that the State Department put on. Why did you attend and what did you make of that gathering? I came because uh, I take all the opportunities to uh, speak about the um, destiny of the Christian communities in the Middle East because I have to tell you we are a little bit uh, fed up with the hypocrisy and the political correctness based on which uh, we the Christian countries are too shy and too modest to speak about the, uh, mm. the fact that there are Christian communities being persecuted very seriously mm -hmm. in the uh, Middle East um, uh, region. And you know, we are also fed up with the approach that whenever we want to speak about the, um, the Christian communities, we are usually warned not to do so and rather say uh, uh, religious minorities. But I mean, we don't want to speak about religious minorities. We want to speak about the Christian uh, mm -hmm. communities in the, in the Middle East. And I wanted to take advantage of this event as well, which we highly appreciated because we see that your administration puts a lot of emphasis, uh, mm -hmm. especially uh, Vice uh, President um, uh, Pence puts a uh, personal mm -hmm. lot of emphasis on on, on this on this matter and you know uh, we have to admit that the Christianity has became the most persecuted religion all over the world and four out of every five persons who are killed for his or her belief are Christians mm -hmm. and and we it's unacceptable and it's unacceptable that um, kind of a context is being put together in the international uh, politics and international media as if uh, portraying as if Christianophobia was, would be the last acceptable form of discrimination. And we totally reject that. Mm. And we have to speak about that openly, straightforward, honestly, like mm -hmm. your president does speak about many issues well, honestly well, and straightforward. Well, and your prime minister won election talking about just these issues, about maintaining the culture. Now, some will say that shows, and some of your critics say, this shows a religious intolerance because you're saying we don't want more Muslim refugees and you should accept more. You would say what to that? No, what we say is that we Hungarians do have the right to make a decision with whom we would like to live together in our own country. Mm -hmm. And we Hungarians do have the right to make a decision whom do we allow to enter the territory of our country mm -hmm. and whom we do not allow to enter the territory of our country. No one can take away this right of ours, be it the United Nations, be it the European Union, no one. This is a core competence of uh, Hungary, of the Hungarian people. This is a matter of uh, sovereignty. We are proud to be a Christian country. We are proud to be a Hungarian country, and we want to preserve that. We want to preserve our culture. We, we want to preserve our heritage. We want to preserve our religion. We don't want anyone to change that. We don't like the idea of changing population uh, among uh, continents. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to we wanna remain as we are. We are, a, we are a Christian Hungarian country, and we want to preserve it as a Christian yeah. Hungarian country. And this is our own right, yeah. and no one can question that, whether this is a right of ours or not. You all passed a law recently making it illegal for people to provide aid to illegal immigrants. What? How is that being received? Okay, the, the legislation says that uh, if you as an organization or an individual mm -hmm. promote the opportunity 
to violate the Hungarian border, mm -hmm. or if you as an entity or a, a person uh, promote the opportunity to, uh, to submit requests for asylum without a legal basis, then you have, to, um, you have to count with consequences. But you know, this is again a security issue, and this is again a sovereignty issue. Mm -hmm. Because if you look back to the last three years, the, la the developments of last three years in Europe, you will see that uh, after the uh, migration uh, flow started to uh, arrive to Europe, 29 major terrorist attacks have been uh, committed in the territory mm -hmm. of the European Union, committed, committed by persons with a migratory background, either by those who arrived with these flows recently, right. or either those who, who, who came earlier or whose, whose, uh, uh, whose parents or grandparents uh, came earlier and were totally unable to be integrated. And if you have a look at the Western European societies, in many places you see double societies or parallel societies mm -hmm. uh, being uh, established. So this is a security issue. So if you promote to violate the border of our country, you have to, you have to count with the consequences. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sierto, I had your um, ambassador on a few weeks ago, and we talked about the efforts of Hungary to help monetarily these Christians you just talked about in the Middle East. Why that commitment? Why the focus on something so far away, outside of your country? Because is it because the rest of the world isn't paying enough attention to them? Because we are a Christian country, and this is our own obligation. Because my question is that if we Christians don't take care about the Christians in need, then who will take care about them? Um, as I told you, we are fed up with the approach that, uh, that it is expected from us to, uh, to speak about all um, all communities, because we Christians have a special obligations towards the Christian uh, communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, uh, when uh, when I attend the meetings of European foreign ministers, when I attend meetings of other leaders, and when I speak about the the necessity to protect the Christians there, you know they are a little bit moderate. I mean they are modest on that. Mm -hmm. Although you have to put it into consideration that that hundreds of thousands of Christian families were forced to leave their homes from places where Christian communities had been there for, for centuries yeah. or, or even before years, everyone, yeah. before mm -hmm. everyone, you know. And, and, and the world just doesn't take care about that. And, and, and I think that the international efforts must aim, must aim to uh, give back the right to the Christians to live where they had been living. In their homeland. In yeah. their homeland. Must give the right to the Christians to enjoy the same rights as all other communities in that given region. Mm -hmm. And must give a right to the Christians to return safely back to their uh, places and to make sure that they will have a safe and secure life there. And you know, uh, bishops, archbishops coming to Budapest to see the prime minister, myself, um, in, uh, in Budapest and, and telling us about the challenges uh, ahead of them. And then we always ask them, so what you need? What's your major right. challenge? So they say, we need to build a school. We need to cover medical expenses of the hospital. Rebuild we the have church. to rebuild the churches. And we say, okay. And we, we finance it directly. Mm. So just to give you a couple idea, Telskov is a municipality in Iraq. Mm -hmm. All the houses of the 1,300 Christian families were demolished. They all had to leave. So we gave money. We uh, rebuilt 991 houses mm. and 991 families could return. This, but this shouldn't be a Hungarian program. This should be an international effort oh. to give back the physical and the legal uh, possibility for all Christians mm -hmm. who had to leave this, uh, their homes to go back. Or we are now involved in a project with the Lebanese that we finance uh, rebuilding of 31 Christian churches in Lebanon. And we finance it. Or we finance building schools for the Christians in Erbil and, and other places. And what, are your, what do your EU counterparts say when you ask them, why don't you join us in this? This is an important effort. We should all, we're all, we're all part of the same heritage. They say what? Because, you know, they are hypocritical and they are politically correct. And they are afraid or shy or too modest to speak about their Christian roots. They say that, uh, that we have to take care about uh, all aspects and they are not brave enough or they just simply don't want to speak about the uh, Christians. There are some, there are some uh, uh, exceptions, by the way. Polish, with the Polish yeah. we work together very well. Mm -hmm. With the Slovaks we mm -hmm. work together very well. The Czechs, so the so-called Visegrad countries in the heart of Europe, in Central Europe, we are very, uh, uh, very enthusiastic on that. For example, with the Polish, uh, we have decided to, uh, to rebuild a home for orphans, uh, which is owned by a, Catholic or a uh, Christian community uh, as well. We pay for it. So, but, you know, we take it as an obligation because, you know, we have been a country for a million, uh, um, we have been a Christian country for a millennium now. 
and we are proud of it. Mm -hmm. We don't hide it. Our, our constitution starts, uh, may God bless the Hungarians. And in the constitution, we write that, that we are a Christian country, we are proud of it, and you know, we, mm -hmm. we, uh, we stick to it's our... It's part values. of your national identity. Of course, of mm -hmm. course it is. And, and when, we, when we have uh, uh, put together this constitution in 2011, we got a lot, of, a lot of criticism from the Western friends of ours. Why we put such kind of things in a constitution? Mm. How unmodern it is, you know? Mm. What does it mean to have Mike Pompeo uh, and the State Department host a conference on religious freedom? They've always had a commission on it, but it was kind of, they filed reports, they, had a, they listed countries of concern, but it was kind of, let's face it, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was paperwork. What does it mean to have leadership coming forward and saying this is an important priority and the White House? I think it's very powerful, a very powerful message. We, uh, we really respect your president. We really respect uh, your vice president and we really respect your secretary of state mm -hmm. and we really respect their and appreciate their efforts mm -hmm. uh, to put um, um, religion, freedom of religion as a very, very top priority of this administration. Mm -hmm. We like it a lot and, and, we, you can, and, and, and I told all your uh, officials that you can count on our continuous uh, support in this regard. And today mm -hmm. the vice president uh, made very powerful messages, very powerful. If you, uh, if you listen to the uh, speakers, they were all enthusiastic uh, about that. And, uh, and, you know, Hungary will continue this, this policy because, uh, because, you know, we don't want to kind of create, uh, we don't want to kind of agree with a, uh, with a con context which ends up basically in Europe that, that everybody has a right to uh, religious freedom except for the Christians, you know? Because sometimes, you know, it's, it's really, it's really uh, against any kind of common sense and, and any kind of uh, uh, historic approach that in Western part of Europe, in some cases, in some countries, uh, people are forced to take off the, the uh, religious, the, the Christian religious right. symbols from the, from the walls of uh, mm -hmm. public institutions, for right. example. But now I have to tell you that um, more and more people uh, in Europe are fed up uh, with hypocrisy and political correctness. And, and there's a shift uh, in this uh, mm -hmm. regard. So if you study the uh, recent decisions of the Italian government, mm -hmm. or the Bavarian government, the Austrian, Austrian government, government, you know, yeah. that's, that's a shift uh, in, in this regard. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I really do hope that, uh, that uh, saying that a Christian Europe will not be a totally empty expression in the future. Well, what would you say to Pope Francis, who has said repeatedly, you're Catholic, um, your, your prime minister has met with the Pope, he says, it is unchristian for a nation not to receive these refugees who are looking for hope if you have the means to accept them and you have the means to accept them. Well, the Pope is always right. This is the number one issue. Mm -hmm. Number two, we as Christians, I believe we have, uh, we have special responsibility. We have a special responsibility towards our people. We have a special responsibility towards our religion and a special responsibility towards our nation. And we cannot uh, allow a situation to occur where the security and safety of our people, regardless of their faith or belief or religion, mm -hmm. uh, so when their safety um, gets in danger. It's we cannot afford that. We mm -hmm. cannot afford that. So uh, uh, ensuring that your people, your nation, uh, can live a safe and secure life uh, is a Christian obligation, mm. uh, basically. Yeah. And in order to uh, put efforts uh, there is a Christian obligation as well. And we will always fulfill these obligations of ours. Uh, the president, uh, President Trump, met with the EU representative and surprisingly, they, dis they came to an agreement on tariffs that they would stop the trade war on tariffs and lower them. Your reaction as a member of the EU? Look, we are a uh, country with a small but very open economy. Our export over GDP ratio is 90.1%. Mm. Our number one export market is the European Union. Number two export market is the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine a country with the size and openness of ours mm -hmm. uh, could be extremely harmed by a uh, trade war between the number one export market and the number two export market. Mm -hmm. So our endeavor, our, our, our desire, uh, what we cross fingers for is to avoid any kind of trade war, any kind of trade related conflict mm -hmm. between the US and the European Union. Number one, this endangers the, um, the stability of the transatlantic relationship, which is extremely important. Yep. And, and number two, that causes troubles on both sides. So uh, we are a very pro-free trade nation. So as your president says, free and fair trade, totally, um, uh, totally sign up to that, uh, subscribe to that. We, we are absolutely in favor of a free and fair trade. We are absolutely in favor of entering into negotiations about a, some kind of a free trade agreement between the United States and the, and the European Union. We are competitive. We have 
yeah. not to be afraid of uh, anything. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have our red, red lines like GMO and, and other stuff, mm -hmm. but, uh, but this can be validated, of course, through uh, putting together the negotiating mandate of the European Union. But mm -hmm. basically, we are interested in free trade instead of trade war. Mm -hmm. I thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. What thank a pleasure. You. Thank, thank you. you. Pleasure was mine. Great insights. Thank Fantastic. you. It was 45 years ago that the film The Exorcist focused worldwide attention on exorcism and possession. Oscar-winning director William Friedkin brought Bill Blatty's novel to the screen with startling imagery. Recently, Friedkin returned to the world of demonic possession, well, not literally, but through his cinema. This time, for real. His recent documentary, The Devil and Father Amort, was released earlier this year. Take a look. Father Amort begins every exorcism by thumbing his nose at the devil. In the room are Christina's family and other priests to assist Father Amort. Santa Maria, Madre di Dio, prega per noi peccatori, adesso è l'ora della nostra morte. Amen. William Friedkin. Thanks, Raymond. Great to see you. Always well, good to see you. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Nice. Uh, I want to first talk about something. Clear something up for me. I read the New York Times last week. Maureen Dowd said that you claimed the 1949 case that The Exorcist is based upon was, quote, jive. What does I didn't that mean? say uh, that I claimed it was jive. The 1949 case, which took place in Silver, uh, in Cottage City, Maryland, mm -hmm. misreported huh. as as Silver, Silver Spring, Spring right. and a bunch of other places. There's no evidence for that. There's no proof. Mm. What inspired Bill Blatty to write The Exorcist were reports of that case. Ah. News reports that said this had happened. This had happened, and it was a case of possession mm -hmm. and a successful exorcism. Mm -hmm. Now, that just passed along into history without people bothering to do a lot of research about mm -hmm. it. One fellow did and wrote a story that you can see on Wikipedia, yeah. which is definitive. It's called The Haunted Boy of Cottage City, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty authentic. Huh. And I believe over the years that I'm not saying that the case didn't happen the way it was reported, but the fact that it was reported was what influenced Blatty. Right. He did not use any of the characters. No, or he the circumstances. Use the place, yeah. the circumstance, and he obviously had never seen an exorcism. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Now, Bill said he came into possession of one of the priests, one of the exorcist's diaries l years later. That's what I've been told. Did you ever see that? No, but I, you know, I've been told by Bill's wife mm -hmm. that she still has the diary of the priest who did the exorcism, mm -hmm. Father William Bowdern, at mm -hmm. Alexian Brothers Hospital in St. Louis. Wow. In 1949. This week, we visited a few of the iconic Georgetown locations featured in The Exorcist, and Mr. Friedkin gave us insight into each location. Bill, why this house? Why did you choose this house as the house where the exorcism was going to take place. This is the house that Blatty had in mind when he wrote the novel. It was the closest house to the steps, but as you'll see, it wasn't close enough. <laughs> but it was the house. This is the exterior of the house where we filmed The Exorcist. It's 3600 Prospect in Georgetown. As you will see in a moment, it is not anywhere near enough to the steps, which are a good, I don't know, 25 to 30 yards away. So what we did, that fence was not there. We had to put up this fence for her later to protect the house, but that fence wasn't there. What we did was we built a false front and a false extension from the end of that house to where the stairs begin, a lot of scenes shot at that front door, both looking out this way and looking back into the house. This is the beginning of the area of the exorcist steps. 
75 steps from just a few feet away to the bottom. Uh, the false front came out to here where these trees are. The girl's bedroom window is just up there where I'm pointing, right up here. And the stunt man went out a window in the sound stage first. He jumped from the little girl's bedroom window in the sound stage and it finished off with a shot of him coming out that window right above me, which looked exactly like the house was extended this far. The stuntman came out of where I showed you and he landed on that first landing. That's pretty far. All of the steps and the corners were padded with rubber. So he was landing on a padded surface, and he was all padded, but it was an incredible jump from right up there where I just showed you to the first landing where he hit. And that's the only place from which I filmed the jump. I also rigged a camera. There's a shot in the sequence, if you see it again, where I rigged a camera on wires to go out the window so it looks like a POV shot all the way to the bottom where that gentleman is now and over that plate is where Father Karras dies in a pool of blood and receives the last rites from his friend Father Dyer. Now why 45 years later would William Friedkin go back and focus again on something you said you'd never focus again on in film. And I quote you, I would never do anything with demonic possession or exorcism in it. Why do this documentary now? Because I believe in its authenticity mm -hmm. and I would never do anything, I, I still say, in fiction. I would never do a fiction version of it again. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to meet Father Amort quite by accident. I asked him if I could interview him for Vanity Fair magazine. Mm. He gave me a long, it turned out to be 6,500 word interview wow. for Vanity Fair. That's a book. Yeah, <laughs> and it was reprinted everywhere. Mm -hmm. And during the course of the interview, he's the most spiritual man I've ever met, Raymond. Mm. And I asked him at the end of the interview if he would ever allow me to witness an exorcism, mm. thinking he would not. And he said, well, let me think about it. And a couple of days later, I got an email from his, uh, the head of the Pauline Order in Rome mm -hmm. who said that Father Amort would allow me to witness an exorcism on May 1st of 2016. Wow. And I had originally met him in March. So uh, once he said, okay, you can witness this, which permission is never granted. Right, never. I can tell you, never, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. Um, I then pushed my luck and said, well, would you let me film it, Father? Mm. And word came back two days later saying you could film it, but alone with no crew and no lights. Huh. So I went in with a little still camera that shoots high definition video and, sh and sat two feet away from them while they were doing it. Wow. Now, you say the exorcism, and Bill Blatty used to tell me the same thing. The exorcist, he said, is about the mystery of faith. Is that what this documentary, The Devil and Father Amort, is? To some great extent, certainly. I mean, there's no proof of anything, Raymond. Mm -hmm. There is not one person in this entire world that knows the greatest philosophers, religious scholars, whatever, mm -hmm. do not know if there is a heaven, a hell, an afterlife, why we were born, what our purpose is here. It's never going to be revealed until, let us assume, there is an afterlife. Mm -hmm. But Bertrand Russell, Teilhard de Chardin, uh, all were offering informed opinion and belief. Mm -hmm. But there's no hard evidence. If, you're, if you need a fact, there are those who need to have their hands in the blood in order mm -hmm. to believe. Now, I have tremendous faith in the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. But 
I don't know anything, and neither do people a thousand times smarter than me. Mm -hmm. Give me a sense of the, what this means to you as a filmmaker. You started your career doing a documentary about a man on death row, The People versus Paul Crump. And here you are, all these years later, doing another documentary focused really on the thing you're probably best known for as a filmmaker, exorcism, The Exorcist. Why make that journey? Any trepidation about turning this into a film once you had the footage of the real exorcism? Yes, and I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Mm -hmm. I filmed it because Father Amort allowed me to film it, mm -hmm. and the woman and her family said, okay. Mm. Uh, then I thought, well, what... I didn't think I would make a documentary out of it. I thought I would have this mm -hmm. to show to interested people. Mm -hmm. And then I got the thought to take it to some of the leading brain surgeons in the country and the leading psychiatrists. Why'd you do that? Well, I felt that they would either debunk it mm -hmm. and or explain in medical and psychological terms what it was. Mm -hmm. The brain surgeons had no idea what this was and said in the documentary to a person there's, including the guy who's in charge of brain mapping, right. you know, for, in this country. Mm -hmm. And he said, we don't know what this is. We've never seen it before. And this is not a problem of her brain, even though everything originates in the brain. But um, we couldn't operate on anything. This is not epilepsy. Yeah. This is not a lesion. Not dementia. The, uh, the psychiatrist then said that in the DSM-4 and the DSM-5, mm -hmm. they now recognize possession. And it's called um, dissociative identity disorder, demonic possession. And oh. they treat people who believe they are possessed. Hmm. They don't say, no, you're, you're not possessed. Mm -hmm. They get an exorcist, as well as their therapy and medication. Unbelievable. Tell me what you captured. You go in, you're holding the still camera up, that shoots, high, that death shoots high death video. And Father Amorth is going through the ritual. This girl, Christina, is there. She is afflicted. What are you seeing? I'm seeing a complete change of personality. Strength that a woman of her size and age could not possibly possess. Mm. She was held down by five strong men, or she'd have come out of that chair. Mm. And I'm seeing her unravel before my eyes during the exorcism. When she came into the room, I thought, what is this woman doing here? She seems totally normal and together. Mm -hmm. And then she sat in the chair where Father Amort did most of his exorcisms for 31 years, mm -hmm. and she unraveled completely. And he went through the ritual, and she was in great pain and suffering. So mm -hmm. initially, I was terrified of what I saw, and that turned into empathy for her because she was in tremendous pain. What surprised you about this? I mean, if anyone's captured what in the pop culture mind is an exorcism, you did that already. What surprised you about the reality as opposed to the fictional creation? The complete change of personality physically and mentally. A complete alteration. It's as though you suddenly sat there and started to freak out and do the weirdest imaginable things, like Charles Manson or something. Mm -hmm. But worse, otherworldly. It was otherworldly. Alleluia, Fissarro, perché tu non conti una cicca. Non ve non conto una cicca. È la mia! È la mia! Ma... È la mia! È di Cristo! È di Cristo! È di Cristo! Now, I did not pump this up. Yeah. This is not made to scare the hell out of people, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, it's not a horror there film. There are no special effects dropped None in. None whatsoever. Yeah. It is a, a recording of an actual case of possession and exorcism. Mm -hmm. And I believed in Father Amort, and I believe that he had devoted the greater part of his life using his skills to help people, and I saw it and filmed it. Now, you interviewed this Christina, the mm -hmm. woman who's afflicted, possessed. What did she tell you about the experience from her perspective? She had 
very little memory of what went on during the exorcism. Huh. But she experienced the fits and the symptoms that led to her having been exorcised eight previous times. Mm. And in that sense, it's like psychiatry in that you don't go in for one visit and then you're liberated. Mm. Often it's a process that takes years, takes years. And Father Amort uh, ha was exercising one man for 16 years. Wow. What did you make of him? The first time you met him. The m most spiritual man I've ever met, extremely intelligent, bright, yeah, knowledgeable. The first thing I asked him was a question about why so is Judas so vilified when Judas was simply a part of the prophecy? Mm. And he gave me an answer. He said, it's true, the prophecy was that the Messiah would be betrayed, crucified, and then uh, resurrected. Mm -hmm. And Judas was the instrument of that. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. And I said, so what's wrong? He's part of the prophecy. Hmm. And Father Amort said, well, he was not a good man. He was a thief. He was a fraud. He had uh, other betrayals, mm -hmm. other things that were wrong. So over the years, that reputation followed him. But if you carefully read the New Testament, he is not vilified by Jesus, hmm. but over the centuries he has become the villain mm. of Catholicism, of, of the church, and mm -hmm. the man who betrayed Jesus. But that was part of the prophecy that mm -hmm. led to mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Give me a thought about uh, how this changed your understanding of what you imagined an exorcism would be. I, I, I would imagine preparing to shoot the exorcist, <coughs> I know from your book, you were obsessed with this project, with this film, and I'm sure you did copious research. Tons there wasn't much to do. Bill Blatty invented the modern concept of exorcism. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that you could read uh -huh. that would explain it or talk about it. Nothing. The novel was self-contained, and then the script that followed. Yes, and mm -hmm. so, but to this extent, one of the psychiatrists I showed this to said to me, well, you know, it looks authentic, but it doesn't have the classic symptoms. <laughs> and I said, what are the classic are symptoms, those? doctor? He said, well, her head doesn't spin around and her body doesn't levitate. And I said, doctor, Mr. Blatty made that up. <laughs> and I had to find a way to film it. But I've never heard of such a thing occurring. <laughs> no, no. And Father Amort never told. But Father Amort, in his first book, uh -huh which is why he agreed to meet with me, mm -hmm. wrote about the film. The exorcist right. he does. said that while the special effects were over the top, it did help people to understand his work. Mm -hmm. So that's why he agreed to meet with me. Amazing. And we hit it off right he away. He told you something about the Satan is, Satan rules the world and he's here at the Vatican. Oh, no, he wrote extensively uh, criticizing the Vatican and things that went on there, mm -hmm. like the priest scandals. Mm -hmm. There was a murder of a right. young girl in the Vatican mm -hmm. that he wrote and spoke about on television extensively. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thought that the people, many of the people in the Vatican were flawed. Mm -hmm. He wrote about it and criticized them when he felt it was necessary. Mm -hmm. And they never tried to stop him or cut him off. Mm. He was so beloved yeah. and believed in. Yeah, and there were, there were lines of people to see him. They would come all the time or try to get an appointment with him. He didn't see everybody. You had to see a doctor that he approved first uh -huh. and a psychiatrist to see if they could help you before he would see them. But he wrote all of his letters in longhand, answering thousands of mail as much as he could. Mm -hmm. He'd get up in the morning and write answers to letters in longhand, uh, write the address on the envelope and stamp the envelope. Hmm. He didn't dictate them. He wrote to people hmm. and inquired further about their problems and agreed to see as many as he could. Now, this woman who is the subject of the exorcism in your film, The Devil and Father Amort, she and her family confront you at one point. They invite you out to their little town 
to, I guess, continue the interview. She had canceled a number of sessions with Father Amort, but she contacts you and they say, oh, come and meet us here. You take the two-hour drive, what happens? <clears throat> we met finally after she changed the time and the place several times. Mm -hmm. We met in an, not an abandoned church, but a very old Etruscan church in the town of Alatri, mm -hmm. about 100 miles southeast of Rome. And it's a very religious town, Raymond. Uh, pictures of the saints in oil outside mm. every house mm. under glass. And she, and I was going back there to film more stuff with her, and she had freaked out. She was possessed again, mm. if not worse, and being held down only by her boyfriend, who was mm. very powerful, yeah. Davide was his name, yeah. is his name, he held her around the throat and around the waist, and she was in a folding chair and dragging him. He was about 6'3", six, 6'4", wow. six, like, built like a lineman, and she was raging. And he was saying, don't show this film. People will celebrate the devil's work if you show huh. this film. And she, in the demon voice, was saying, no, no, I want it shown. I want this shown. Ooh. Like this, I want this shown, oh. but louder and more wow. disturbing. And so do you think that was Satan speaking? I don't know. Or was that her speaking, struggling to get her message out? Raymond, I just don't know. But she was speaking in a different voice mm. and demanding that it be shown mm. while her boyfriend was saying, you know, it would glorify the devil. Now, so I had certainly a moral problem there. Was I going to show this or not? Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. Mm -hmm. It was a home movie. Yeah. But then I decided that I saw this. People should see it and make up their own mind. This is really mm -hmm. what is known as possession and exorcism in the Roman Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. This is it. It's as close as anyone's going to see. Most priests have never seen one. No. I don't know any who have. Mm. And most cardinals or bishops, the very few popes were exorcists. John Paul II yeah. was an exorcist no. in Poland and left three cases to Father Amort, mm. one of whom he w was uh, exorcising for 16 years. Now, you shot this exorcism before our friend Bill Blatty died. Yes. Did Bill know about this project? I told about him all about it, and I was planning to take it back to Georgetown and show it to him when I got it together. Mm -hmm. And he didn't live long enough for that. What did he think? Bill obviously maintained his faith as far as I'm concerned, oh, yeah. right to the end, mm -hmm. and so believed in the possibility, uh, if not the probability. I, I mean, Bill had come through a lot of changes in his own life, but maintained his faith and wrote The Exorcist as a believer. Yeah. And I directed the film as a believer, hmm. not as a skeptic. Yeah. I'm not a skeptic, hmm. but I don't have any finite answers to anything. Do hmm. you? No, well, none of us do. Our job is to ask the questions. I always tell people that they get upset sometimes. You know, why do you have to ask that? Well, that's our job. I'm press. I press. But whether I'm doing this or I'm writing a novel or you're doing a film, our job is to raise the questions so that the viewer can seek those answers. But you Some, strongly believe well, sure. in you, the existence of the Holy Trinity. And, and God the, himself, of God course. Himself. Well, and you see evidence of that in the natural world. Mm -hmm. but Or you don't. Well, I and do, don't. and you can try to share that vision. Yes. But whether somebody else sees it, you can't give them your eyes. But you can lead them and help them see a different way. It is the mystery of faith, Raymond. Mm -hmm. And I'm not skeptical about it. Mm. Because I hasten to add that I have no answers. You believe Satan was present in the room when you were there with that girl and father? Well, look, there's evil in the world. Mm -hmm. There is evil. Mm -hmm. No question mm -hmm. in the world. And there's good and evil in all of us. Right. And sometimes it manifests itself, whether we want it to or not. Mm -hmm. Road rage at the simplest yep. level. Mm -hmm. But it is there. 
And Satan to Father Amort represented that evil. But he did, now he did believe that he had dialogues with Satan. And I'm going to tell you this. He told me that at one of the exorcisms he did with this woman, she recounted his sins to him. Mm. And it was accurate. Wow. She was correct. I did not press him and ask him what his sins were. Mm -hmm. I had at least that much of a level of taste just mm -hmm. to not go into it. Yeah. But he told me that they were accurately portrayed mm -hmm. by this woman in the demonic persona. And, and in Latin, and they speak different languages. At she times. understood Latin but had never studied it. Uh -huh. And uh, he, the exorcism is, of course, in Latin. In Latin, yeah. And uh, so, but she understood it and could converse with him in Latin. Hmm. And very often in the voice of the demon. Huh. But um, look, I don't know. I can't tell you that this, I believed in Father Amort and hmm. still do. That because of what he said and did, I was dealing with something that was real. Real. You interview in the film one of his assistants, Father Amort's assistants, and his sister was possessed. Mm -hmm. And he recounts to you what she went through. She does as well. Tell me what you learned there. His name was uh, Paolo Vizzavecchio, and mm -hmm. he has his own insurance business in mm -hmm. Rome, yeah. very successful man. He and she described to me the time when she was possessed and crawling up the walls mm. and on the ground like a snake and hissing and reaching out to harm people and vomiting and going through many of the things you see in my exorcist movie. Mm -hmm. The police were called. They wouldn't come in the room, wow. the carabinieri. They saw her in this state and would not come into the room. Mm -hmm. He got her finally to Father Amort and she and he describe it and what happened. She has very little memory of uh, how her symptoms were, but he has total memory of it. Right. But she remembers being liberated by Father Amort mm. after many visits. Did she feel she was being controlled by something else? Someone else? She did, and I believed her. Mm -hmm. She had no reason to lie to me. I didn't know them. Mm -hmm. I found them through Father Amort. And they had no reason to lie to me, but many people are aware of her story, and she's liberated. Hmm. She is no longer possessed. When you look back, as you look back at your body of work, everything you've done, this battle, this struggle between good and evil seems to be at the heart of all of it. Now, I would argue some of your latter films, Killer Joe and others, these are dark films, but it's still that battle. Yes, Do I you think see it's, that? Yes, Raymond, it's eternal. It's a, an eternal battle between good and evil to possess our body and soul, I believe. Mm -hmm. There is evil in the world. Yeah. Pick up a newspaper. Mm -hmm. Look at Syria. What is that? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not talking about the president's response. I'm talking mm -hmm. about Assad gassing his own people. You know, now he's going to kill them in some way, but uh, the, the, that's one example of many, and in history, you look at Stalin, who killed 20 million of his own people, and Hitler, who killed 6 million Jews and Catholics and homosexuals. What, how do you define that? Mm -hmm. who, wh wh why is that necessary to achieve power, mm -hmm. to kill all of the people who disagree with you, or don't even disagree? Right. You just single them out, drag them out, and kill them. Yeah, there is evil. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in, in my own sphere. Yeah. What did Father Amort and his lifelong example teach you, not about evil, but about good? That a man was there willing to devote his skills and his life to helping to liberate people of what they believed what had them completely in check mm. and in choke. Mm -hmm. Their lives were not their own, and they went to Father Amort as a last resort, mm. and he liberated many of them. But he never believed he did the liberation. 
they always call upon Jesus to do the exorcism. That's what the prayer is. It's not the priest as, come out as, of there. as yeah. in my film at one point saying, I cast you out. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus that they're praying to, to cast out the demon. Mm -hmm. And that's what Father Mort believed. And I believed in him mm. and still do. What do you want people to take away from this project? After seeing this film, what do you hope it's going to accomplish? Well, it was better said by Shakespeare mm -hmm. in his play Hamlet when he had Hamlet say to Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio. Mm -hmm. And that's my belief. Mm -hmm. I believe there's just so many things that I don't know or understand, but I'm still curious about, mm -hmm. but don't know or understand. And hopefully this film, which is not fiction at all, not special effects, not, does not set out to terrify you or show you outrageous events. Mm -hmm. the, the possession enough is outrageous enough. But I believe that this film is a, a, a doorway into that, mm. into more things in heaven and earth. And one of the doctors in the film that I interviewed, who I showed the exorcism to, said, well, and he's the man who's in charge of brain mapping, mm -hmm. said, well, just because we don't believe in something or know something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Ah. It's kind of a double negative, but it's true it nevertheless. Works. We don't know about this, but that doesn't mean it isn't true or doesn't have a name or will not get another name later, like radiation. Right. You know, they knew nothing about it right. when it occurred. Now it's a field of study. Mm. William Friedkin, always a pleasure. Thank Mine, you. Raymond, thank you. I look forward to the next project, and we'll have you back. I always love to come back and to watch this great show. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. Being here. The Devil and Father of Mort, directed by William Friedkin, is out now on DVD and digital streaming platforms. Finally tonight, we take a look at the dire situation in Syria for the Christian population there and the ongoing persecution of Christians in the region. Here's my interview with Maronite, Catholic priest, and special envoy to the U.S. for the Apostolic Union of Clergy, Father Andre Mahana. Take a look. Give me your sense, Father. You have been watching this situation, particularly the, the cause of Christians in the Middle East for all these years. As you look at what's happening in Syria, give me a sense. What are you hearing from church officials on the ground and human rights groups? You work and interact with a lot of them. How does Assad treat this Christian minority? How does any Arab government treat Christian minorities in Iraq and Syria? In Iraq and Syria, Christians are protected. It's a fact of life. Their sites are protected. Their churches are protected. Mm -hmm. They're not being bombed. Now exposing the um, official government inside Syria will be detrimental to Christians. Our churches will be completely annihilated. The tombs of the saints, already St. Mary's tomb mm -hmm. two weeks ago in Brad was bombed and nobody okay. ever said, and the president or anybody did not shake aside to say there is a heritage, there is a civilization that is there and it's being wiped out. Uh, do you think this could or has the potential to go the same way as Iraq Worst. and Egypt? Worst. Worst. This is not regional. There is a huge battleground going on inside the Middle East now. And that this is a move that is going to affect an international conflict, not a regional conflict. Mm. This is going to affect the world religions and monotheism. It's going to affect the Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's going to affect Russia, United States, China, Iran, Israel. That's going to be worst. That's mm. going to be worse. That's going to be up to a nuclear escalation. I consider this a sign of time as Our Lady of Fatima spoke about. Wow. You know, it's, you, you see with the players involved, with Russia and Iran funding the Assad regime and with the United States and Israel on the, on the other side there, and they do have a common purpose, all of them, in eradicating ISIS and, and that terrorist remnant. But it's very difficult and gets very difficult to distinguish one from the other. We tried arming the rebels who then turned guns on American troops. So... Uh, uh, how you extricate yourself from this Raymond, and yet stay involved is a, is a challenge. Raymond, thank you for allowing this really to happen between you and me today. I'm speaking to all our American citizens, to all people of goodwill, to all Christians, to Catholic intentionally and namely. 
we are leading a campaign to eradicate ISIS, but it seems the fact is that we are eradicating Christianity. Mm. That's a fact. That's what the leaders are seeing That's on the, the byproduct. That That's we, the that byproduct. The byproduct is that you are not eradicating ISIS. You are totally eradicating Christianity, Judeo-Christian principles, rules, and the sanctity of life, the sites, the heritage, the books, the manuscripts, the museums, the, even the tombs, they are being eradicated. The human life is being wiped out. So if you are really meaning to eradicate ISIS, focus on ISIS. By focusing on ISIS, challenge Islam, challenge radical Islam. Talk to them about stop murdering people because they cannot tolerate them for who they are and their faith. They're raping women every day. They're raping our children every day. In Egypt last year, I brought you pictures and photos of Palm Sunday bombing where they aligned over 33 children. And as the children were chanting the name of Jesus, the radical Islam was shooting them one by one. Did we bomb them back? Did we make an action like this? I think I just want our president to calm down, pray, and listen. This time, the United States needs to make a good action, not repeat a scenario like Iraq. Mm -hmm. We must not. He cannot afford such a mistake. He's a good leader, well, and I want to encourage him. This is one of the very last remnants of Christianity in the region, in Absolutely. the entire Middle East. I mean, Syria, Lebanon. You have a little remnant uh, in Egypt that, that holds on, the cops, but they're leaving in huge numbers. And who can blame them, given what they face every day? Now, you've started something called the Save the Persecuted Christians Coalition. Correct. What is that? The Save the Persecuted the Christian Coalition is a spontaneous act of love, faith, and hope. Over the 1,000 Protestant leaders decided to come together, and a few Jewish rabbi with our apostolate of Our Lady of Hope, Mission of Hope and Mercy, to start a nationwide banner campaign, a simple banner campaign that states mm -hmm. on it, Save the Persecuted Christians. Uh -huh. And our website is savethepersecutedchristians.org. It has a simple that letter noon in Arabic, mm -hmm. which stands for Nazarene, right. basically, to state that we want to render awareness. We are asking churches, synagogues, places of worship to take that banner, put it in front of their churches, remind the people in America to wake up and that they need to do good because Christianity today is the largest religion in the world that is persecuted. 215 million Christians are under persecution. 100,000 Christians in places are killed every year. Up between one hour to nine minutes per day. Mm. Every one hour and every nine minutes there is a Christian being killed. That best kept secret in the world for the last 200 years, killing millions of Christians, must stop and America can stop it. So those coalitions decided to come and do that simple banner campaign stop or save the persecuted Christians. And our website is savethepersecutedchristians.org. And I believe mm -hmm. people must act upon this, order those banners from us and join this coalition. Our next step is in Denver, Colorado on August 18, 2018 at an ecumenical prayer breakfast by the Archdiocese of Denver, the Eparchy of Our Lady of Lebanon for the Maronites. We are really asking people to to challenge themselves to what I called American spiritual diplomacy. Mm. And what does that mean? American spiritual diplomacy is to take the value of life to the nation's leaders and to mm. take, to tell it, to let them know before you address a situation in the world, address your moral authority first mm -hmm. and encourage every leader in every nation. Stand up for faith protect religious freedom, and in the 21st century seeing that the world is going to be filled with religious wars, and if mm. something going to lead, it will be religion going to be a source of disappointment for evangelization. Our kids look at religion now, look at conservatism, as you and me know now, as a bigot place, as a place that they do not want to be, mm -hmm. as a cause to kill people. That's not what faith is. That's not what Christianity and Judaism is. The hardcore of Christianity and Judaism is the sanctity and the value of the human mm -hmm. person and life. Well, we will keep monitoring this situation. Father Mahana, thank you for being here. I think, you know, as you, as you were talking, I'm thinking of almost 20 years ago when uh, George Bush was about to go into Iraq, and I had on this program 
Chaldean officials and leaders from the Chaldean Church in Iraq warning against moving in because they feared what would happen. As bad as Saddam Hussein was, they feared removing him would unleash forces none of them could foresee and bring about the ruination and destruction of this cradle of Christianity. That is what happened, and I fear we're looking at the same thing in Syria. Raymond, may I be just clear, and then we close down. First of all, any intervention should allow a transformation to happen. What's been happening so far in the Middle East, none of our military interventions in that part of the world was accompanied by a good environment for change. Mm -hmm. If we were to intervene this time, make sure you have the transformation team in place. Otherwise, you're going to create a vacuum and worse than ISIS going to happen and going to end up being. At the end, Christianity is a target and United States religious freedom is a target. We must protect both. Mm -hmm. May God bless us and I pray for the safety of the people of Syria. Thank you, Father Mahana, Thank for you. being here. We'll talk to you soon. For more on Father Andre's work and how you can help, visit Save Christian Middle East. It's all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter. The links are RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.